Hey gamers, it is once again ad time. First, I'm going to plug myself. I have a Patreon now, and if you'd like to see this pod get bigger and better, I would deeply appreciate your support. Head on over to patreon.com slash beyondsolitaire to help out. Second, Central Michigan University's Center for Learning Through Games and Simulations is up to its usual awesome business. Their first game, Monumental Consequence, has arrived stateside, and you can still order it through their Kickstarter page. Rising Waters is undergoing a few tweaks, but will hit Kickstarter soon. And if you ever wanted a certificate in applied game design, CLGS is offering amazing classes online that will help you earn one. Up next is Lamar Smith's Visual Storytelling, Game Art, Design, and Branding, which sounds absolutely amazing. It starts on October 11th, so make sure you sign up. And with that, it's time to start the show. Hey, gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire. And this week on the pod, I have a very special guest. I have Paul Wright. He is professor of writing and narrative design at Cabrini University. Oh, narrative <laughs> arts, sorry. <laughs> So tell me, what is writing and narrative arts? It sounds awesome, actually. Uh, yeah, so that's our rebranded name at Cabrini for our former English department. And part of the reason we did that was to put the focus on writing of all sorts, not just creative writing, but also nonfiction writing, scholarly writing, technical writing, you name it. And the idea of narrative arts is to be more um, inclusive and, and multidisciplinary and multimedia in our approach to storytelling. So. We're still a literature department, but we also do plenty in uh, film and media studies. Oh, that's super interesting. And you and I met because we have a connection through Reacting to the Past. We had a great time recently at the Reacting to the Past Game Development Conference. So for people out there who have not been watching all my little vlogs about it, uh, why don't you tell us what that is so that we can right. enjoy? <laughs> so first, uh, Reacting to the Past, for those who might not know, is an engaged pedagogy method that's in use across the United States and now in many other countries as well. It's focused on close reading of important texts, but also on getting students into really intense role-playing exercises that help them understand historical moments of crisis, particularly the clash of ideas at critical moments in history. And it's a method being used for other disciplines now, not just history, uh, but across the humanities and even in the social sciences and in the hard sciences. The reacting community hosts a number of conferences every year. Um, most famous is probably the annual institute, which is usually hosted at Barnard College in New York. It will be, I hope, again in 2023. But the other big conference every year is the reacting game development conference. And this is where designers and instructors who want to generate new game ideas and new games for eventual publication, this is where they go to test out their ideas, to present the idea for a game for the first time, to maybe play test it for the first time, to get feedback from other designers in order to make it the best it can be before it gets into the hands of students and instructors around the country with an eye towards eventual publication. Oh, that's, that is super interesting. So the way that, so the, the game development conference is so special because it is games in their more raw form. These are games that are not yet published. Uh, how do you decide which games you're going to test at which conference? Because I feel like there's a lot of games that are constantly in development. So how, what, what stage does game have to be at to be game developed at the conference? So if you're talking about the other reacting conferences, whether it's the annual institute or the regional conferences, for example, there's one upcoming in winter in Georgia that you know about, usually those conferences will feature games that are already published, very much on the way to be published or in an advanced stage of development. They've been play tested by many people around the country already. But at the GDC, we're actually looking for something quite the opposite. We're looking for games in their rawest most raw form uh, in order to see if the game idea can you know, blossom into something that's actually playable and usable by other instructors beyond the person who has the idea for the game. So the way we decide which games get play tested, and usually we have more applicants than we can accept, is we're looking for a game that for one, covers an area of history or cultural inquiry uh, that hasn't been treated before using the reacting method, something that's new in terms of focus and orientation. We're also looking for games that um, 
maybe trying something very different in terms of mechanics or design approach, games that may not be proven to work yet, but that have an amazing idea behind them, not only the history behind them, but also the mechanics behind them, and games that you know have the potential to engage students and to get them thinking about the clash of ideas, which is always our criterion for any good reacting game. There has to be that critical clash of ideas. So within that realm of many games that could fit the bill, um, we're also looking for games that are developed enough to have an actual play test. So the designer has roles written, the designer has an instructor's manual of sorts, uh, a game manual for the participants and the players. It may be very raw, very incomplete, not ready for prime time, but it's ready enough to put into the field. And it's in the field of play testing as with any game, right? That's where you're actually going to find out if it works or not. And if it's something that will be a benefit to other people and not just be a great idea. I'll say just about every idea I've ever heard for a reacting game has merit to it. There's, there's an appeal to the idea, but it's a big difference between having an idea and having a prototype that can actually be play tested and has the potential to be used elsewhere and be published down the road. Interesting. Uh, the other thing I noticed about this particular conference is that there were a couple people who had never played a reacting game before. One of them was me. And I think there was maybe one other person who hadn't done it before. Can anybody just sign up for a game development conference or, um, you know, is it limited in some way because of the nature of it? Like it's about testing instead of trying a finished product. So in principle, I don't think we would ever turn anyone away from the GDC who wanted to register and participate, but we do try to be truthful in our advertising and make clear to potential participants that if they've never done a reacting game at all, if they have very little exposure to game-based learning in general, if they really just want to learn about the pedagogy for the very, very first time, um, they might be better served at one of the other reacting conferences, namely the annual institute. So we often will encourage people to go there. Um, that said, there are plenty of folks who just decide to dive in because like myself and everyone else involved in GDC, they like looking under the hood of a great game. They like, see, like seeing what makes it tick and what could make it better. And so with that in mind, we have had people who've just jumped in you know, all the way into GDC for the first time without having done any other reacting conference. You're one of those people, but you're so experienced with game-based learning and because of your podcast and a hundred other reasons, I think you were perfect to jump into the GDC. Um, I wouldn't say it's for everyone. You know, your mileage will vary. Although I will say that we had a grand old time trying out different games. I think you and I were in all three play tests together in various roles. We were. Working more or like we weren't on the same side every time, but we ended up working closely together every time. <laughs> so I don't have a, a deep background of reacting to kind of assess what was going on, but it seemed to me like there were lots of interesting things happening mechanically across the different games. So what mechanisms showed up at the GDC that were kind of newer to reacting um, and therefore fun for testing this time around? Yeah, and, and the caveat I'll, I'll share, you know, before saying more is not only are these games that are very raw and in development, we're also playing them in a very intense and constrained time frame, right? Usually 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. each of three days for three different games. A true reacting game is gonna take place, you know, over the course of weeks in a classroom. So it's a very compressed experience and it needs to be just in order for the game to get its first, you know, testing. Um, that said, what did come out of the tests I was involved in and that you were involved in were a few things worth noting. Um, the test we had for 1492, which is Kyle Lincoln's game, someone I know you've interviewed for the podcast, his uh, approach to um, the struggle between Castile and the Muslims of Spain and all the other participants and players in that early modern era, um, one of the things I really liked was Kyle's decision to have a kind of remoteness between the monarchs in play right, the Christian yeah. monarchs, the Muslim monarchs, and everyone else. So that if those other characters, those other players wanted to get the ear or the favor of a true power player, like a monarch, 
it wasn't just a matter of striding across the classroom and asking. You couldn't do it because what Kyle was trying to simulate was the remoteness of power in the medieval and early modern world. And therefore you had to go through all these layers and intermediaries and bureaucratic steps in order to have access to the monarchs. And that's not something we've often seen in reacting games. Most reacting games, as different as they are, whatever period they're set in, whatever their themes, usually everyone's in the same classroom and everyone can more or less talk to everybody else. But this was a game that actually chose to create a buffer, which I think is historically accurate in a sense. The other game that you and I were in was um, Kelly McFall's Algeria game, which treats the struggle for Algerian independence versus the French in the 1950s. And what Kelly attempted there was basically to run uh, two games in parallel. So you have um, the Algerians who are agitating and in some cases taking violent action in the name of independence. He had them in one game in essence, outside the room where everyone else was. Everyone else was more or less representing, um, for the most part, right, the French moneyed and landed interests that were invested, right, in keeping uh, Algeria in the, the French sphere of influence. And so you really had two games going on at the same time, which, you know, these two buffers, because it's interesting, both of those two games had buffers. And it was, I think, historically accurate. I think it was engaging and interesting in its own way. The risk of it, of course, is that you have disengagement, right, where the participants aren't really getting to talk to the other people in the classroom that they need to talk to from a pedagogical standpoint, right? And I think that's something both Kyle and Kelly are going to work on with their games in order to create enough interaction, but at the same time, keep those distances uh, where they need to be. I don't know if that was your experience as well. Yeah, actually, that very much mirrors the experience that I had. I thought it was really interesting, like, when you're thinking about a reacting game, part of it is the gameplay, which I think worked, you know, quite well, at least from my perspective on the roles that I was playing. But there's also having different experiences. But if you want students to learn the the whole amount of information you want them to learn, they might be limited by being on one side or the other um, in that situation. And so there's like a, kind of almost like a butting heads situation of like, okay, so is it gonna be about the gameplay or is it gonna be about making sure that everybody gets like more of a global perspective on this issue, which is probably what a professor would want. And so there's like a couple different priorities in the mix. Um, the other thing I noticed at this particular reacting conference, and I think that this is so um, for those of you who aren't there, uh, I actually got invited as the keynote speaker. Um, so sorry about that, Paul. <laughs> oh, no, you were great. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, what, one thing I really noticed about this particular conference is very interesting is that um, I think that reacting to the past is also kind of in flux in terms of how gamery it wants to say that it is and kind of like do the people who do essentially what are in-class LARPs identify these as games or as gaming and then what are the consequences of that for the mechanisms that make it into the games is that an impression that you have from somebody who's like way more on the inside that's an amazingly important question and I'm not going to answer it in any perfect way I'm just going to engage with it uh, first though I will say that you know we loved having you as a keynote speaker in part because you had not been exposed, certainly not overexposed to reacting in any meaningful way. And your you know, participation in the conference was so well received that people on the board agreed that we wanna have a keynote speaker all the time and that it should be someone ideally who isn't plugged into the reacting world already. It should not be preaching to the choir, right? That we need people from other communities and other interests to come in and give us their perspective on the pedagogy. Now to your, your big question, right? To what extent do people recognize or own or embrace the gaminess of reacting? That is um, a discussion as old as reacting is, which is many decades now actually. Um, and not everyone you know, will see it the way I do. For me at least, I see no problem whatsoever in owning and embracing the gaminess of something that is an effective tool for my understanding and for my students' understanding to be uh, increased and augmented and intensified in a way 
that is is actually fun. I don't apologize for the gaminess and I don't apologize for the fun of what we do. Um, Johan Huizinga, way back, right, uh, made clear that uh, ludology, right, the study of human beings at play, is an integral part of the study of human beings at large, right? So we as um, cultural beings, social beings, we are in, involved in all kinds of rituals and encounters with one another. And some of those things we call games. And that's perfectly fine. It's a part of human existence since the beginning of our culture, of our civilization. And it's a part of who we are now. And we have to own that and embrace that. I think most people in the reacting community now do. Um, not necessarily to the degree I do. It doesn't mean they're all gamers the way I would self-describe. But I think um, people who are really passionate about this pedagogy um, want it to work and don't try to pretend it's something other than what it is. They just want to use it in order to get their students learning more than they ever otherwise would. Um, and I think from that point of view, um, everyone that I know in this community, and certainly all the people who go to GDC, we're constantly looking for connections between our games and other games. Uh, games that are as old as the hills and games that were made last week. Um, games that are board games, games that are video games. Um, we are constantly looking for those connections. We want to cross-pollinate with a wider world of game-based learning, uh, of which we are, I think, a very important um, a subset. So speaking about bringing games into other games and using them as inspiration for reacting, you did a very important service for me while we were at uh, the GDC. So uh, we had game nights every night for those of you who are out there. And my most exciting game night was where we got to play Republic of Rome. I was so excited to have somebody teach me that game. Um, so before we talk about it more and maybe some of its applications, which we did discuss uh, at this conference, um, why don't uh, you give a, sort of a primer on like what actually happens in Republic of Rome for people listening so they can get a sense of like why we find this so exciting. So Republic of Rome is in certain ways an old school game that came out of the wargaming tradition, if you will, that was published by Avalon Hill, I think back in 1990 or thereabouts. So it's been around a long time. It's currently out of print, although you can find copies out there. What's unique about it is that it takes a deeply political and social look at the rise of the Roman Republic and its eventual descent into an empire. And the game looks at the history of Rome in three periods, right? The early Republic, the middle Republic, and the late Republic, which we associate with the Roman civil wars, Marius and Sulla, Julius Caesar, et cetera. And the game does far more than simply consider um, the military challenges Rome faced at any given time. The game is just as interested in the economy of Rome, its foreign policy and relationships with other powers in the Mediterranean. And above all, it's interested in the jockeying for position and advantage among the Roman patrician class, right, the senatorial class. And so the players in Republic of Rome, each of them is playing a collection of Roman families and sometimes famous statesmen who are jockeying for advantage over one another. They want the offices and the power and the wealth that comes with that. But at the same time, they have to work together in order for Rome to survive. And this is especially pronounced in the scenario you played at the GDC the early Republic, where you have all these external threats to Rome. And so there are more ways, frankly, to lose than win in the early part of that game. You can go bankrupt. The people can rise up as a mob and slaughter all the senators. Uh, you can also be defeated by foreign powers, whether they are the Carthaginians, Macedonians, Gauls, etc. So you're really fighting the game together and at the same time fighting one another. And if you play the whole thing through, you get to a point in the late Republic where you're no longer as worried about the external threats. Rome has things pretty much in hand, but now the threat is internal, right? It's the threat of not only political rivals, but someone who might decide to cross the Rubicon, take an army and march against the Senate. So it's a deeply social, deeply political game. I would say it's one of the best political games ever made. 
Um, and it has so many moving parts uh, that I've continued to be fascinated with it for many, many years. So I expect to be fascinated with this game for a long time now that I've learned to play it. I can't wait to like get that solo mode out. It's high up on my list of things to do. But we had a really interesting conversation about how to incorporate something like Republic of Rome into a class. And I think just to kind of set this up, one of the things that was very interesting about reacting is that it is very much about the class of clash of ideas and everybody has opposing goals and there are you know definitely reasons to enter into the game and play hard but i also think that in some ways it's harder to see the exact consequences of what decisions you make in that room because the game is mostly about talking um there are mechanisms now that kind of simulate what happens uh we had a lot of die rolls going on during play testing but i feel like some of your ideas about republic of rome like maybe offer consequences in a way that a game that's about having a conversation can't. So would you be willing to kind of talk through some of your ideas for how you could use something like Republic of Rome like in an actual class context? So one way I've thought of using it, and I haven't done this yet, but it's on my mind. Um, and of course it would involve teaching students Republic of Rome, which would take time and take a bit of a commitment. <laughs> Although you could probably pare down the rules to something a whole lot more bare bones, more manageable than the whole package, which is great fun, but maybe too overwhelming for a first year college student or high school student or whoever. Um, yeah. But the core of the game, right, as you saw, is the debates that happen first in the forum, where people are jockeying for advantage, but more importantly, even the debates that happen in the Senate, where the senators are making their case for who should get what political offices, who should get what economic concession, uh, i.e. path to corruption that they can claim as their own, um, how many armies and navies should be built, which enemies should be fought or not fought at all right now. And so there's that whole social talking dimension of the game that the die rolls and mechanics are meant to um, bring to life actually. But I think anyone who's ever played Republic of Rome knows the joy really comes in the group of people you've collected around that table and how they interact. So one thought I've had actually is to do one or more reacting to the past games that treat Roman history. So there's one on the Ides of March, there's another on Catiline. Um, I think there's some others in development as well. And it would be fascinating to me to use the Republic of Rome framework to simulate the actions of senators and factions that the students are not playing. So the students will do their debating and their you know, negotiating amongst themselves, which is typical of any reacting to the past game. But the Republic of Rome board game could provide a, a scaffolding and a structure to represent what the rest of the Senate is thinking and saying and doing. And often in a reacting game, it's the game master, the teacher, right? Like someone like me, who will say, here's what the rest of the senators in Rome think about your proposal. But what if I didn't default to the instructor deciding that? What if I was able to automate a kind of solo version of Republic of Rome to work out what the rest of the Senate is doing and what it thinks about what the students are proposing and have those two um, worlds, if you will, impact one another? Yeah, I also really liked, so I had a good amount of fun um, arguing at that table about who should get what, who should be Pontifex Maximus, who should be the military consul this year. Um, oh God, do I have to let this person be the consul who stays in town again in order to get that military consulate? Uh, so there <laughs> were lots of very uh, interesting little arguments and decisions and, and bits of wrangling that happened. And I really like the idea of making that be more role-played as well. Like having students actually have to give speeches to everyone about what they want and why they want it um, instead of just being like yeah okay I'll go with you I think it'd be hilarious to have to actually simulate a senate meeting where it's like yes I concur with the proposal of Scipio uh, we should do this and actually have people um, be, be forced to like do it in a real way uh, I feel like that would be a really interesting way to teach about Senate procedure and how that wrangling actually works. And so instead of everybody having to do it around the table, you could actually like let them talk and then have them come back and and decide in that in a more dramatic way. That would be the beauty, I think, of marrying something like that to reacting, because reacting 
insists upon the students writing papers and delivering speeches for the most part that are uh, persuasive yet grounded in fact uh, in the way you're describing. Whereas in Republic of Rome, um, that gets abstracted, right? So a senator's persuasiveness in Senate is represented by an oratory score, right? Yeah. What you're talking about is a student actually having to live up to that oratory, to have to deliver the oratory. By the same token, in the forum phase of that game, you can use your uh, persuasion and your influence to try and steal someone else's senator to your cause and to your faction. That would be another opportunity for a student behind closed doors, if you will, but still in writing and speech making uh, to make the case to the senator that they want to bring into their, their faction. Yeah, I actually really like the idea of moving that away from numbers and into actual reality, but then still playing the game. Um, I, I, I think it'd be very interesting to do that. And the other aspect of the game that was, you know, the military aspect of it, I, I can, in a game as chunky as Republic of Rome, I can understand why battles work the way they do, but um, it would be so interesting. Uh, I think we talked about maybe using something like commands and colors as a way to mimic an actual battle. So instead of it just being a die roll, it's like you actually do have to plan out maybe with advantages or disadvantages, depending on how many fleets you have and how many legions you sent and how good a commander you sent. Like you could have advantages or disadvantages in the game and then try to actually play and win a battle. I love that because uh, being a fan of the Commands and Colors series in all its iterations, Ancients, Napoleonics, Samurai now even, um, my heart is still with that Ancients version of it. And I could easily see marrying that to reacting in Republic of Rome in order to handle this military side in a totally new way and to shape the battlefield conditions of a Commands and Colors game using what had been happening uh, in the reacting sphere, right? In that social sphere. Um, and having the students develop battle plans and things to justify, you know, the particular battle they choose to wage against, say, the Carthaginians. Where the board game can again help you is in telling you which military threat looms largest right now. Who is it that is demanding Rome's attention at a given moment? And where might the battle actually be happening? I think the hardest thing, this all sounds like something I would totally do, uh, both as a student and as a teacher. Uh, the, the one question I always have to ask myself, so I just had my first day of full classes uh, at the day of this recording, so this will run later, but, um, you know, my largest section has 34 students, <laughs> 34, and so one of the hardest things about trying, I think, to marry board games into a classroom is that, you know, at least for reacting, you can write more roles, or you can kind of, I know that some professors have done things where they combine roles, so there's like pairs of people acting as one person, um, but with a board game, it's harder to keep everyone engaged because not everyone can play. So as somebody who's kind of interested in bringing board games more into a classroom, like, do you have any ideas for that? Or are you just as stumped as me? No, I, well, I, I'm always stumped to some degree, but I do have some ideas. And I've shared some of these ideas at reacting to the past conferences before. Um, I'm not the only person trying these things, but I'm someone who's usually willing to try something at least once. Um, regarding your first comment that reacting lends itself well to the larger groups because you can have more roles, I think that's absolutely true. Um, not everyone thought of it that way early on. A lot of people thought it was better for the small seminar, say of 15 to 20. But as reacting started to be used across the country and many people were using it at larger state institutions where they had huge classes, um, the need for a given reacting game to accommodate any class size, right? Anything really from 10 to 50 or more. I mean, I've heard people trying larger numbers even. Um, I'm not saying it's easy, but it can be done. And I think reacting has been very um, self-conscious on that front to develop games that accommodate larger classes. As far as how you bring a board game into a classroom, uh, that say really wouldn't work well normally beyond two to four, maybe five people. Um, here's something I've tried. So for example, I've used Twilight Struggle in my classes before. I've also used Volker Runke's Labyrinth. And both of those are card-driven games that as pure board game experiences, they're excellent. Um, they work with two people. You have two opponents. So in Twilight Struggle, 
you have the both two sides of the Cold War, right? You have the Soviets and the Americans. Um, but I found ways to use that in my classes. And here's one way I've done it. I create two teams when I use Twilight Struggle in class. So if I have a class of 20 people, I'll have 10 people on the Soviet team and 10 people uh, on the US team. I'll usually find someone to be a captain on each side, a person who's going to be more responsible for knowing the rules than others perhaps, someone who's ready to be a leader of that sort. Um, but in essence, how do you do a card driven game that was meant for two people with 10 people on each side? Well, what I do is basically a baseball lineup approach. So each team say has 10 people, that means whenever the Soviets are up, they will have someone in their lineup who has to make the next card play and all the decisions related to it. So if it's an event, they'll decide how the event is implemented. If it's a movement of pieces on the board, that person will have full authority to make that decision. And so you own the card in essence that you're up to play. And what's interesting about that is I insist that the students uh, take note and record of which cards they played in the lineup. Why? Because they have to write on those cards and the historical events informing them when they actually do their written work for me. So they get a choice. I mean, they'll probably by the end of the game have played five, six cards at some point. So I don't have them necessarily write on all five, but I give them a choice, write on three of the five cards that you were responsible for. And they have to report out to the class as well, not just write a paper. They have to tell the rest of the class, you know, why this um, crisis mattered, right? Why was this so important? So if the Vietnam car comes up in Twilight Struggle, then somebody who played that card better be ready to talk about Vietnam. So basically it's a way of kind of making accountability and paying attention a little more like you have to you have to offer an incentive for students to do that so they don't just zonk out for the entire game when they're not immediately playing that's right and sometimes the captain's job is to make sure that someone who's less engaged uh gets back into the mix and takes it seriously um while at the same time respecting that whoever's up in the lineup has the final say on how that card is going to be played and everybody just kind of has to live that the thing I think that is actually more accurate and realistic about this is as, as much as we think of the Cold War and Twilight Struggle as a bilateral struggle, it was never the case that there was just one person on each side making every single decision, right? We're talking about nations and alliances and coalitions, and even within a nation, not just a leader, but their cabinet and their advisors and their military officials. So having students actually share the play of a card driven game like that, I think actually simulates the messiness of getting people on the same page. So when a given student is up and doesn't play a card particularly well, I encourage them not to, you know, have recriminations and blame the student, but instead to think about how hard it is to get people to actually coordinate on anything. Um, ordering a pizza, let alone the Cold War. <laughs> you have a good point there. <laughs> and uh, so since we uh, since we met at a reacting conference, that's how I know you. Um, you've also designed a reacting game that uh, I believe, based on our conversations, was inspired by your experience with board games. So how did you personally bring your knowledge of gaming into the reacting game that you wrote? So like a lot of uh, reactors, a lot of uh, reacting to the past designers, um, not all, but like a lot, I did plenty of role playing, you know, in my time and still do. Um, I, I've done my share of, you know, not just D&D, but a ton of other role playing games. But I also have a long experience with war gaming and board gaming of all sorts, Euro games, you name it. I'm definitely an omni gamer. I'll play anything and everything. Um, so when I finally heard about reacting to the past, which I guess was around 2006 might have been my first real exposure to it. I was delighted because I felt like there was a tribe of people that understood the world the way I did, understood the value, the educational value of games, and were willing to you know, put that into practice with this role-playing pedagogy. So I fell in love with it um, very, very quickly. What occurred to me though, is that there could be cross-pollination between my gaming resume and history and what I want to do with other people's reacting games, 
but above all, what I wanted to do with my own. So mine is a treatment of Renaissance Florence. It's called Machiavelli in the Florentine Republic. And it treats um, a particularly volatile period of Florentine history, uh, 1494 to 1512. It's a good uh, 18 year period of, of chaos and innovation and creativity. It's the period in the history of Florence when the Medici were finally kicked out of Florence and they had a Republic without the Medici. It's also the era of Michelangelo and da Vinci and Machiavelli, of course, who gives his name to the game. So my game, um, which is still in development and it's one I've been working on, it's been play tested around the country by a lot of people now. And I'm very grateful for all their insights. Um, the challenge of that game then and now is that unlike other reacting games, it's covering almost 20 years of history as opposed to a particularly intense year, a few months, or even four or five years. This is 18 years. So I needed a framework for the game that would allow it to cover that history and create an opportunity for a module, modular design, by which I mean, I have three parts to the game and an instructor can play any one, two, or all three of the parts. So there's an early part, a middle part, and a final part, which is very much familiar to those who know Republic of Rome. So Republic of Rome was one of my direct influences in designing Machiavelli. Because of that early, middle, late Republic perspective it took on Rome, I felt like there had to be a way to do that in reacting. And it's something that I called way back when an accordion design for reacting. You know, you could compress the accordion and just stick to one short, you know, scenario, or you could expand it and you could play the whole thing. And I've been really surprised and gratified by how many people other than myself have played the whole thing. I figured most people would do just one, two parts, that'd be it. But a lot of instructors have done it all and they've given me so much insight uh, by being willing to play test the whole shebang, which is how I teach it. Um, so it really was a case where my gaming interests dovetailed with what I wanted to do in reacting. And a lot of other people are using that accordion design now as well. Um, I'm hardly alone in that. And to whatever degree people have been inspired to try it, um, then, then I think the game has served its purpose, even though it's not finished yet. Awesome. So for people who are going to try reacting games, either because they uh, want to try it at the classroom or uh, because they are just into history like that and want to try one at home, uh, how do you get started with reacting? How does a person like decide, I'm going to do this and then get into it? So uh, the best thing to do first is to go to the reacting website. Um, and it's reacting.barnard.edu, I think, but I could be wrong. Uh -uh. What is remember, it now? We got it's lectured what? by Kelly McFall about this. It's reactingconsortium.org. Reactingconsortium.org. That's the new, <laughs> the new address, uh, which I keep forgetting. I keep typing in the other one. That's, that's my problem. Um, that's definitely the best, best place to go because it summarizes the pedagogy and it invites you to explore the games that are really uh, polished and published and they're ready to go. The things we do at GDC or even my Machiavelli game, uh, at least in its current state, they're really for people who've done some reacting and are willing to try something experimental and new. But there are many, many games already published that I'm sure you know people like Kyle and Kelly and Nick Proctor and others can tell you about. Um, those games are, are ready to go out of the box as it were. You don't have to have a ton of experience with all of them to make them work in your classroom. Some are better suited uh, to the first timer than others. The one that most people try first is Athens, which is about um, Athens in the time of their democracy, a democracy under siege in the wake of the Peloponnesian War. It's also the time of the trial of Socrates, which is one of the things that can happen in the game. And that game, while the issues involved are very complex and rich and, and fascinating. The game itself is very inviting and welcoming to the first timer. It was my first game. And even though I had done plenty of gaming, including role-playing before reacting, I had not done reacting. And so there was a learning curve even for me. So games like that one are nice entrees. Um, then there are other games that are published. One of my all-time favorites, the India game, which looks at India's securing of independence in the wake of World War II. Uh, 
Uh, and in many cases, the game results in the same thing that happened historically, the partitioning of India and Pakistan. That's a really complex cultural, historical situation, political situation, even linguistic, ideological situation. And the game is a little more involved, say, than the Athens game. Uh, so your mileage will vary. It depends what it is you want to teach and what it is you want to get out of the experience. One thing I tell people who use my games, and I think all good designers believe this, is once the game, published or not, is in the hands of an instructor somewhere else, then the game has to become what that instructor wants and needs. I never get offended if somebody takes my game and does something totally different and off the wall with it because someone who might be doing an art history class and doing Machiavelli has very different purposes than I do in a class that's more focused, say, on Renaissance humanism or political theory or Machiavelli or whatever. So I never get offended if someone repurposes my game. I think that is a sign that the game is alive. And I think that's true even of the published games. Everybody uses them for a different purpose. Some use them for first year writing seminars and great books courses. Other use the, others use them in a senior capstone context. Many are now using it, as you know, in high school. Uh, there was a time when reacting was pretty much a college thing, but just looking at the Discord server that has been established for high school instructors on which you know, I, I lurk, um, I can see how many high school instructors are thrilled to be using reacting and getting involved in it. That's only good for them and only good for reacting. Actually, that leads into the last serious question I was going to ask you, which is so um, I went to this uh, conference as I think it was the only high school instructor there. Uh, it was mostly professors, but it's very clear that reacting is kind of making a shift towards high school. Um, how large would you say that movement has gotten? And uh, I actually need to get into this discord. <laughs> <laughs> um, because I, I really do want to see what other high school people are doing, but what kind of uh, adjustments to reacting are necessary to make it work with high school constrictions? So first from this sort of history of reacting perspective, when reacting showed up on the scene and Mark Carnes, you know, innovated so long ago to give us this great pedagogy, um, it was primarily a college phenomenon and often people thought that it would be something better suited, say, to honor students or particular cohorts of students that were ready for it. But I think very quickly people saw that any cohort you know, in college could potentially benefit from reacting. Doesn't mean every last implementation of it is right or will be perfect, but there are a lot of uses for it. And as the uses expanded and as our perspective on reacting expanded, people started saying, hey, there's no reason we shouldn't share this with high school instructors too. They might have to adapt, the material for it, the game for it, but they should have access to it. There were some who didn't want to go that route. They wanted to kind of keep reacting a university and college brand, if you will. But over time, I think the desire to see the pedagogy spread and the desire to bring more people into the fold and the recognition that, you know, if you have students who've done reacting, say, in a high school, and then they come to college and are asked to do it, how much better is their experience going to be? How much better are those college classes going to be if they've actually experienced reacting before? Um, so there are just too many advantages not to have broadened our reach to high schools. And now we have a significant community that's passionate about reacting. We're not seeing them at GDC all the time yet, but I think that's going to change. I actually think our number of high school instructors at GDC is going to go up every year. I can't predict what the numbers will be, but I'm certain that we're going to get more of that energy. And I'm certain we're going to see designers coming out of high school. And that's only a good thing from my point of view. Um, what do you have to do to make reacting work in a high school setting? Well, reacting is focused on close reading of important texts. It does kind of have a great books approach, if you will, uh, to the material. And that could be something you have to adapt when you bring that to a high school, right? So instead of reading the entirety of Plato's Republic for the Athens game, which some high, uh, college instructors will, will do, you might have to use excerpts. You might have to you know, reduce the amount of commitment for the student to get into that historical and narrative world. So there might be adaptations of the reading. There might be adaptations of the mechanics. 
You might have to think about shortening the experience if you feel like um, it, it might, you know, peter out too fast and you fear being committed to it for too long, or if you have a number of other things that you've been told, you know, by your, your school board or anyone else that you have to cover in your class, you know, this conversation, then a full length reacting game may or may not be right for your high school. But there are any number of ways, it's that accordion model I was talking about earlier. There are any number of ways to contract the experience or to change it to make it more appropriate to high schoolers. It's more a matter of managing expectations. Um, yours, theirs, everyone's for what you're gonna get out of the game. And if you do that you know, thoughtfully, then it can work. Uh, may not work perfectly the first time, but it will work as you adapt. And we have plenty of high school instructors right now in the reacting community who are helping us, those of us who teach in college, to see the different ways that the games can be repurposed for different audiences. We also, by the way, have plenty of people in reacting world who want to do short versions of games for college and high school administrators that they want to get on board with the pedagogy. So that too is a process of adaptation. And I learned that the hard way. The first time I tried to run Athens for a group of faculty and administrators at my institution, it didn't go so well because I didn't think about the audience and I didn't think about the time constraints because I didn't have much time. So um, if you're thoughtful about that, you can make it work. Um, there are plenty of people who want to use reacting in other contexts as well. Um, John Truitt, uh, someone you know well, has worked on bringing reacting to the past to Gen Con. Uh, so we've actually had not just gamers at Gen Con, but people in the gaming industry, the corporate side of gaming, uh, participate in the French Revolution game uh, led by Mark Carnes himself. So there have been many different contexts into which reacting has been repurposed. And I think there will be more. I think the sky's the limit. I agree, and I very much hope that we're right, because I, I, I think that's super exciting. Uh, but on a lighter note, what games have you been playing for fun lately that you have really enjoyed? Ah, so I've been playing a, a fair share of games over the summer. It's not that I have nothing else to do, but I do have less structured time in terms of being in the classroom, right? So I've been able to get a number of things to the table, mostly soloing. Um, Three come to mind, they're the three most recent. So one is uh, Arc Nova, which I don't know if you've played yet, which is, uh, you have, uh, I think oh, yeah. it's a good game. Uh, and it's really interesting because the premise behind it is yes, you're building a zoo and you have the world's animals to choose from to bring into your zoo. But there are, first of all, logistical and economic headaches that come with making your zoo. But even more interesting to me, is there is a conservation push in the game that's intended to be honored, right? That it's not just about making zoos, but it's also about conservation, which could include releasing animals back into the wild. And I really like that the designer, uh, Matthias Wiggy, I think his name is, um, I like that he integrated that mechanism. And in fact, I've learned the hard way that conservation is so important in that game that if you ignore it, you will not win. I, I, I assure you, you cannot win that game without giving close attention to the conservation side and not just the, oh, I'm making a zoo side. So that's one I've played both solo and, and with other people. I've also done um, two Volko Runke games recently. One is Almoravid, which is an account of 11th century Spain, the conflict between the Christians and Muslims there. I actually had Kyle Lincoln play it on the last day of the conference, um, in part because he was noted in the bibliography of the game which I thought was cool, a reacting instructors in the bibliography of a Volko Runke game. And Volko, as you know, is uh, friendly to all kinds of game-based learning, including uh, reacting. And I also am playing right now Fire in the Lake uh, with the new expansion, The Fall of Saigon, which takes the conflict all the way from uh, 1964 to 75. So the bitter end of that sad conflict is covered and, and that's been my latest craze. Awesome. And uh, if people want to find you online and ask you questions about nerd things, uh, where can you be found? Or can you not be found? You're a man of mystery. No, no, I definitely can be found. Not that hard to find. Uh, Paul.Wright at cabrini.edu is the best place to reach out to me. 
Uh, I'm also on Facebook, although not always, you know, plugged in as much as I might want to be, but I'll definitely uh, see any email that anyone sends me and, and get back to you, whether you're interested in reacting to the past or game-based learning at large, or just games, uh, I'm happy uh, to talk to you. Fantastic. And uh, for those of you who are listening to this podcast, hopefully you know I can be found anywhere online as Beyond Solitaire. Paul, thank you so much for coming on and giving us thank some you. of your time. Uh, this was awesome. And I hope we talk again soon. Absolutely. Thank you so much. For those of you out there, please like, subscribe, comment, uh, you know, ask questions, and most of all, happy gaming. Mm -hmm.